Good afternoon, PIDS organizers. Uh, thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, principled AI, whether this is something that would truly benefit uh, Filipinos. Uh, I had, uh, uh, I've been privileged to be uh, tasked by DTI to develop the uh, development framework uh, for, for AI in the Philippines. Uh, so it's been out. That's probably the reason why I got this uh, gig. In any case, uh, let's, um, let's delve into it now. So what is Principled AI? There is a video that I have prepared for you. It's a very short video. Uh, I encourage you to check it out even as I, I explain uh, my slides. It's something that you can do. Uh, you're used to multitasking anyway. So uh, you can just uh, keep your um, speaker down and maybe have some headset because I won't be able to discuss in details uh, the principle. It's been uh, a result of debates. We had so many sessions consulting the stakeholders in the Philippines and uh, the, the debate rages on, to say the least. Um, but um, many of the, the points already have been taken up by previous speakers. Uh, Sophia's work has been a tour de force, uh, so I won't be repeating uh, those points in, in a way. So um, this is just a rundown of the AI principles. Uh, the thing with principles, you can have 20, you can have 50. <laughs> uh, and I, I decided to earn the side of parsimony. Uh, spending more with less. Hopefully, six would just be good enough for, for us. Uh, so a rundown, uh, and I, I see that uh, some of the principles could be collapsed, uh, inclusive growth, sustainable development, and well-being. And it's really what, what uh, beneficence amounts to. It's not something that you just feel. So when you play with AI tools, you get the feeling that you've been helped or you, you feel the uh, triumphant that you have uh, come up with that paper uh, quickly enough. But there are really objective correlates, objective measures for saying that the country is experiencing a boost in its totality of well-being. Human-centered values and fairness, uh, they are very much related because you would want to uh, put AI at the center of uh, decision-making. You don't want to be um, assigning uh, exclusively uh, to AI uh, the decision, especially for high risk uh, operations. It's good that when you do operations or automation in your factory and there's not much uh, consequences, you're not deciding on behalf of people, you don't really much, don't need much humans anyway. And fairness is, is even a moving target for the Philippines. We know that Philippines is a highly unequal country and it has been dragging out in many of the metrics. No? Robustness, security and safety, um, our precision agriculture has been mentioned earlier on that we would be needing uh, greater uh, robustness, uh, security and safety, and many other workplaces would be requiring that as well. Accountability is an important consideration because at the end of the day, uh, you cannot put AI to jail. That's just the bottom line. You need people to be actually responsible. And, and I, I know that uh, it can be scary. For instance, the Privacy Act is, has been scaring off people. That's why it's been a cottage industry. Some of our lawyers having these uh, seminars and uh, expensive seminars just to scare them off. Uh, but the idea is really accountability and it doesn't have to be really that expensive. Uh, transparency, explainability, and traceability. This is the the center of contention with many of our AI developers because transparency as a matter of public policy is one thing. Transparency in the level of the code is another because you're dealing with uh, AI systems that are essentially block boxes. Even AI developers themselves cannot explain what they're doing. How much more to expect that from, um, from everybody? So it's a serious problem. Uh, there are some, some solutions, there are promises, but uh, um, we haven't seen the light of the tunnel, I mean, the end of the tunnel just yet. No? Number six, uh, I've been insisting on this in many debates, and um, I see this as a distinct principle. The, the conventional wisdom is that we just have to be more transparent, bombard people with data, you know, how we operate, the principles, the policies, but um, we should know better that uh, in, in, in de for decades now, uh, governments have been increasingly transparent, yet such transparency do not necessarily translate to people trusting governments. 
there could be a bifurcation. More transparency could be less trust, actually. And so I've been saying that um, for our, especially for our AI developers, we may have to give them room to really be able to shine, to be able to do what they think, because you're able to do what they do best. Because if you just keep on breathing down their necks and uh, insist on explainability, uh, faceability, even before you are able to uh, get a, a head start, that may kill innovation also. It may have that kind of uh, unintended consequence, even as you pursue um, um, principle five. So you may need trust as a distinct, uh, as a distinct principle. So... Um, I promise to just gloss over this because there's a video that's supposed to accompany uh, this. Uh, yeah, so so the idea is, you know, you have to have all this because uh, it's a it's a delicate dance that somehow you need the faith of your people in in leaders. You need the faith, or you need the faith of your people in uh, AI developers in uh, in projects of governments. No, uh, when when they pursue uh, when they choose to deploy AI in many of our processes. So uh, what are the benefits of principled AI? So when we say principled AI, it's just a shortcut for all these principles. Call it, some would so call it responsible AI, but there are other principles. And so I chose to uh, use the word uh, principled AI as a shortcut for, for uh, the set of principles that we just uh, talked about. So I urge you to take a look at the a development framework that uh, we have uh, developed earlier on. So that's the, the URL there. So you see figures, so say AI is beneficial and you see these figures being thrown around, um, uh, trillions of, of uh, dollars in productivity, um, companies adopting AI, uh, boost in uh, labor productivity of, I would say 40%. Certainly these figures are uh, and even in their application. So you don't see 40% across the board. You don't see 70%, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very uneven. And so uh, instead of AI having an effect of, uh, you know, promoting equity, it may even amplify the, um, the inequalities in, in social inequality. So it's, it's, it's very dangerous that way. So there, are, there have to be measures to, uh, to address these uh, uh, issues. So um, many um, many pitches already have been made about uh, how how AI could benefit society. But uh, at least from where I where I where I stand, uh, we're looking at uh, the effect on on uh, on um, forecasting. I just um, I happen to also work with DOH, and um, yesterday <laughs> we had a discussion about how how the EMR, the electronic medical record, could be used to um, manage and if not uh, predict um, uh, diseases. No? Um, so uh, as a way of surve um, disease surveillance. No? So before you even say it's COVID, if there's a way of uh, directly um, analyzing data sets from patient records, you could see, for instance, concentrations in geographies uh, in, in the country of say 39 degrees Celsius in temperature. And that somehow gives away a uh, certain infection going on in that particular area. And so that's gonna help you uh, move around resources. Uh, there are many other, um, you see protein folding, for instance, has been sold already by AI. And you see this mRNA as a good platform to um, potential to, um, to address cancer. And you see this also uh, happening already in, in some of the areas, I mean, in some of the regions like Thailand, China, and India are very aggressive. Uh, um, you can also AI to help address, uh, you know, the way we run things, and that is health inequalities. Uh, you see um, how facilities are uh, evenly distributed or unevenly distributed, that's one, and the utilization. And all this can come in a at least uh, almost real-time uh, um, dashboard no. uh, data. Uh, so nurtured agriculture, uh, very much similar to discussions earlier about precision agriculture. Uh, I need not, uh, I will just gloss over this, but certainly um, we have a... a a coherent initiative towards this direction. Now, if I may just uh, plug in a little bit, uh, and that is the, 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 the initiative of our university to uh, really go into BARM. And the thinking, why BARM? 
And uh, the thinking, at least for some of my colleagues, that if you cannot save BARM, you cannot save the Philippines. <laughs> because BARM, Soxargen, uh, Caraga, Bicol, they just keep on uh, dragging down our, uh, our outcomes. Uh, I mean, the stats anyway. And so as a, as a, as a university, with, um, with still with limited resources, but enough expertise perhaps to really help BARM in terms of a development initiative. Uh, uh, yeah. So we're going there, hopefully with partners, because we cannot do this alone. And this is where the agriculture part will, will come in, among others, uh, because still BARM is uh, pretty much agricultural in, uh, in modality of production. Right? So um, I will skip the, the other parts and then um, maybe just uh, a little tale. You can look at the details of that, but um, just to give a, a little bit of story uh, getting into this uh, part, um, a few days ago, the British Embassy uh, came, uh, sent a representative, uh, talked to me about how uh, Britain could help, the UK could help um, us with, with governance, with, uh, with, with um, AI governance. And I was telling them that uh, thank you very much, but please uh, embed this in actual problem-solving exercises, capability building for the Philippines. And there are big problems uh, that needs, uh, you know, uh, AI solutions. And this is where probably the British government can help in terms of uh, expertise sharing, as opposed to just talking about, you know, uh, AI principles. Not that I'm, I, I don't like them or I, don't, I detest them, but, you know, talking about governance uh, in, in, in very specific ways. No? And so these things are basically just the, uh, the candies that can be dangled in, uh, uh, for, for our, for our uh, uh, companies, uh, SMEs, big companies, uh, part of the, uh, the exercise no? of, of uh, deploying uh, AI in, in the Philippines. So, um, so let me just do a, a quick rundown of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the, some of the initiatives in AI. This is certainly very arbitrary. So we're monitoring legislations. And by the way, I've been insisting that legislation is not the same as governance. Uh, uh, you know, legislation is not even just regulation, uh, not equivalent to regulation. These are three big areas. They are related, but not the same. So um, some of the initiatives of our um, of our of our uh, uh, people of, of our people in the Senate of our um, leaders in the Senate would include um, you know access to increased access to to internet. This is fine and dandy. Uh, there's all sorts of of uh, um, drafts on on AI as well as on intellectual property, not including. Uh, bigger initiatives or legislative initiatives in uh, digital transformation. One Angara bill, for instance, and there's this uh, YAP bill, and there, there are just so many going on, but perhaps we need to, uh, we need some time to really see them consolidate their, their initiatives because there's not uh, enough resources to fund all those unless they're really uh, consolidated. So there's all these uh, bills but uh, maybe not enough to, uh, to, to really, that's, that's more like top-down approach, not enough to uh, address all the, the requirements for, for AI, uh, making AI useful to the rest of the country. So um, as been emphasized in this forum, we're largely SME community, uh, SME country. Uh, we have large, uh, uh, large businesses, as large as NOA counterparts in, in many parts of the world. But then the idea is if you really help the SME scale, uh, help them uh, get to their market faster, more efficiently, and then you'll boost productivity among SMEs. You'll be able to uh, really help them with, uh, with uh, ICT tools, including AI. But, be, uh, but you know, short of that, um, you may have misfirings happening because um, um, some priorities may not really be boding well with, with uh, the needs of uh, underground. No. So, so um, some of the, the, the findings would be about uh, AI applications uh, uh, in, in business or SMEs, or there are just a few of them. No. Uh, some MSMs are incremental and situational development levels. They are not uh, ready to scale. 
Uh, there could be insufficient physical and technological infrastructure, as as uh, discussed uh, um, uh, in in ample fashion in in this forum, uh, roads and other you know uh, side uh, side infrastructures. You no, know? so there's there's so much going on beyond AI that need to be addressed. Now, I, I'm not going to say that they are prerequisites to AI, but they have to come to converge at some particular point. One of my favorite C is, uh, CEOs uh, uh, in, in, in the Philippines, she, she keeps on emphasizing in forum that what we have really is a coordination problem. Because uh, even as we have this, you know, really good initiatives, they all fail eventually because the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing because even if you have only limited um, initiatives but they are coordinated the power can be their power aggregate power can be um, can be amplified no? so so we have problems so when we talk about uh, ai uh, i cannot help but we but emphasize that we could be somewhere in the Gardner hype cycle. So we have the innovations like chat GPT. It depends, oh, by the way, when I, when you speak of AI, it's a diverse set of technologies. There's not one AI, but what's hitting the media, of course, the, our attention, and that has been the generative AI. Uh, I've been a user, for instance, of chat GPT when it's beta, so it was no surprise to me when it came out uh, big time. No? So you see, uh, there's this trigger, um, but then we're probably seeing, I, I, well, in, based on anecdotal evidence, that chat GPT could be peaking already in terms of inflated expectations. The more I see frustrated people around, the more I'm actually content <laughs> that somehow we're nearing the really the more, you know, uh, rational or the more uh, tempered uh, uh, expectation in terms of use of, of, of AI. So... Please keep on using generative AI, and hopefully you'll be bored with them, uh, with, with those technologies, so we can uh, really get to that throw of disillusionment and get to that slope of enlightenment, and somehow that's really going to help us uh, get to real productivity. I see that some of the companies are very strong in the use of, of uh, for instance, generative AI in their marketing. There's one bank that says that declares, my goodness, our marketing department fully utilizes ChatGPT and we're, they're, they're so gung-ho about it. And I would say that that's really a very narrow kind of application of AI. There's so much more, especially uh, many of our problems are very much flesh and blood. <laughs> but uh, but there are, there's going to be convergence in terms of how we use AI tools anyway down the line now. And I'm hoping that we get to that sooner than later. And the way to do that, as you know, economists, is to really just shorten the feedback loop and accelerate learning that way. Because the longer <laughs> the feedback loop is, the harder it is for us to learn as a country, as an organization, as, uh, as institutions. And somehow, the inefficiencies are making the feedback loop even longer. No? So that's, that's where we want to go no? so that we can use this, you can get past the hype cycle or at least the early part of the hype cycle. So can principled AI truly benefit Filipinos? Uh, there's the, we have to do <laughs> the, the if part anyway. Uh, if we have to address the gap between livable wage and you know minimum wage, there's a huge gap between uh, between that uh, between the, the two. Um, we have to get to livable wage uh, or living wage anyway because AI operators need uh, cannot operate with with their stomach empty. Suboptimal nutritionally, meaning suboptimal AI AI wise. No? So we want to get to that uh, level. So um, we also have to address income inequality. Um, and you see the evidence in, uh, during the pandemic that the countries with, that are more unequal actually fared worse than the countries that are more equitable. So if there's maldistribution of income, the worst outcomes actually for you would be for us as a country. So you have the stats. I need not go over them, uh, uh, but, but the idea is you might want to consider really uplifting the bottom. As I said, you cannot save BARM, you cannot save the Philippines. No? And uh, that kind of thinking applies here as well. No? So uh, they can just income from a higher top. Uh, maybe um, there are many ways to do that. Uh, the economists would know better. 
uh, economic, you know, from my from a layman point of view, it's all about incentives and uh, taxes <laughs> and uh, you know things around those those areas. So you might consider uh, really doubling down on. Uh, on on the in, on income inequality, no, um, unions have uh, you know are 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 getting a, a mixed rap, mixed uh, mixed reviews. But as you can see in advanced industrialized countries, oh. unions are partners in development. You want upskilling, you want reskilling, involve your unions. You want better governance in terms of AI, involve your union, because um, that's that's where the baseline is. So if they are not willing to upskill. There's not much you can do. You can take them to all sorts of training workshops, but if they are not willing, if they don't see the the forest, so to speak, they don't see the light, then they won't be able to to help you with upskilling and reskilling. So, in, in stronger union, as a matter of fact, and there are challenges, of course. Uh, um, my colleagues would say, "Oh, let's have legislation on on uh, on on workers," but I would say that. There are existing laws already that we can leverage uh, to address uh, problems of workers. For instance, the way we would do redundancy, update the IRR so that it will be more receptive to, for instance, to uh, the onslaught of, of, of AI in the workplace. Uh, I suppose so. So, when do you consider a person or a worker redundant? That's something you can. The, the guidelines for that so something can be updated with uh, with uh, with with the development in, in AI. So uh, importance of union, again, uh, raising of wage re related to living wage that we want to, to get to. Um, just wage, of course, a part of the, the equation. Uh, protection, um, someone, one of the speakers uh, said that, you know, uh, uh, AI, the, the ethical AI is about ultimately about uh, human rights and, and that is how, how we connect, uh, we protect workers' rights as well. It's not, AI is not going to be antithetical to, um, to, uh, to AI. No. So I'll, I'll, let me just rush a little bit. Uh, there are differences between yes, but uh, accessibility is, is something that we need to, to consider. Uh, in order to be able to make AI useful to Filipinos. Uh, there's a strike, very educated people threatened by AI. These are the writers of Hollywood. So, uh, and there's of course many nuances around that. It's not just, you know, that AI would suddenly take away their jobs. There's also like revenue sharing, all these issues. But the idea is uh, AI poses a, uh, a threat to the industry. And that's how you would want you would want to, to talk to the writers, for instance, the creatives. And when very quickly, uh, when I speak to um, we have many creatives in the country, and they've been gung on say we've always been around, we will survive, and that's a good feeling. But maybe um, it's more um, celebration rather, really, you know, uh, a clear realization of what of what the threat, how how enormous the threat is. No, so. Um, I will skip that. Uh, by the way, if you're interested, there is a companion notes for, for my slides so that you can take a look at the, the, the thought anyway, the, 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 and the evidence that we have or the, the, the literature that, uh, that comes with, uh, with, with this uh, presentation. So uh, there are pathologies, and, and they say that uh, one of the, those would be unhealthy dependence on AI. Um, I'm probably getting there myself. Uh, hard to do research these days without AI. Uh, there are many platforms. The Philippine Social Science Council, which I think the Philippine Economic uh, Society is also a member of, uh, is running a workshop, and I'm going to lead that workshop uh, in, in October, on the use of AI tools in research. So there's going to be a discussion of that. But um, but in, in some areas of human relationships, uh, AI is showing to be um, pathological, at least uh, in so far as uh, AI would be replacing human relationships, uh, or at least uh, superseding human relationships, and that can be uh, a pathos in 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 society. So um, some of the more comical uh, examples would probably be something like this. Uh, <laughs> so you can marry your hologram, uh, not full AI just yet, but uh, that's that's one 
one of the things that 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 can uh, go around. Uh, oh, by the way, our, our young people are no longer marrying. Uh, this is probably an alternative. <laughs> so we have just dropped in the in the in the uh, in the rate of reproduction, human reproduction. So this is one. So finally, uh, we have to get to this level to. Um, we have to address these things to be able to really make AI uh, useful or beneficial for our people. Digitization and infrastructure. I have made so much beef with this. For instance, procurement is one of my my issues, my uh, my uh, my thing, you know, favorite gripe. And that is if you can only leverage, for instance, government and uh, you know leverage the scale of government, we can do a lot of savings. We can promote greater transparency. How many laptops are being procured as we speak right now? And um, it's something that you can say in three years, the book value is zero. So that in year two, maybe you can start procuring at scale and you can create greater efficiency. And that is going to be about digitization and infrastructure development, workforce development. Uh, I happen to... Uh, the champion uh, micro credentials, and we're trying to put together. Uh, please you're, join us uh, when we put together the micro credentialing consortium in the Philippines, and that is to set standards uh, and advocate for the deployment of of micro credentials. Because you cannot scale AI without micro credentials. You don't need a four year degree in computer science. In fairness to our computer scientists in the room. If you just do the thing, of course, you still you probably would need a more solid training in in computer science. But for other layers of workers, you would want your training fast. And the thinking of some of our colleagues that we need to have all this formal training. No, you have to have to hit. You have to hit um, training uh, for just in your labs. There are many people there who can already do Python. Certify them as Python programmers, good enough for industry, and they probably can do moonlighting while being students. Uh, you know, doing AI as they continue their uh, their work. Regulation, as I said, is just a subset of governance, and legislation is just a subset of regulation. There are many things we can do in terms of regulations without having to resort to legislation, because the thinking of our people is that they go straight to legislation, and that is how you ossify uh, thinking. There's not even a sunset law in our legislations. And so we have so many legislations that are turning out to be useless and are, um, are ways of shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, think about uh, you know, uh, the, the optical media board, <laughs> which is basically a useless board now, uh, given that people are no longer reproducing via CD. In the case, uh, research and development, uh, yeah, and then um, I've been uh, not more. Uh, I will probably just skip the details of this, uh, please. And then, uh, yeah, then finally. Oh, um, we have to really get, get back to my point on trusting uh, government. I know government is not... <laughs> Not in a very good place, uh, at least some, an overall anyway, except for some uh, some government agencies, uh, because that's where you want to allocate resources in a more uh, efficient way, you now in an efficient manner. Um, look at the education. We have a serious problem in terms of um, basic uh, reading proficiency, and reading is a gateway skill. You cannot do AI if you cannot read. <laughs> And problems for the Philippines are enormous. We are in the bottom of reading proficiency. And that is something that should shake us. Because if that is not shaking us, I don't know what will. No? Tax reform, uh, I need not. Uh, but, but anyway, if you get to that kind of book, uh, it's about, um, about ultimately about AI containment. The advanced developers of AI would say, please regulate us. But then the message heard by developing countries that regulate us so that the developing countries would not be able to outpace you or to catch up with you. And that's one of the unintended consequences when you say regulate uh, AI. Thank you very much.